Now I want to talk to you about how I do my job. I had like six minutes left. How I do my job in a competitive field. How each day I try to beat the Notre Dames, North Carolinas, and everybody else. How am I going to do that? All right, I think everybody has to have a personal philosophy of how you live your life. All right, here's mine, very simply put. You plus motivation equals success. I have that only thing in my locker room. There's nothing else in my locker room but that sign. You plus motivation equals success. I have it on cards, bookmarkers. I have it on everything. I, it's, it's what is, it drives me. It's a passion. I was 16 years old. I heard the Reverend Bob Richards speak. Remember him, the Wheaties guy, the Kathleen uh, uh, pole vault champion Olympics? And this is what he said, right? The gentleman said it before, but this is, what, this is what, I was 16. Bob Richards looked over a group of these young kids at a basketball camp and said, the Lord must have loved ordinary people because he made so many of us. And here I am, 16, thinking I'm special. And here's a man I respect said, the Lord must have loved ordinary people. He made so many of us ordinary. And I was a little, you know, you get a little down at 16 when someone's telling you that. And then he said the line that changed my life at 16 that I felt then. I'm 41 years old. I've been working 21 years in my business, and I feel it the same way today. He said, every single day, in every walk of life, ordinary people do extraordinary things. Ordinary people accomplish extraordinary things. And I raised my hand. I'm applying for the job right now. I'm an ordinary guy. I want to do extraordinary things in my life. And I believe it. I think that's strong. I think that's what it's all about. And I know, I know this group has that same feeling. How do you do that? How do you go from the ordinary to the extraordinary? I think it's the second thing. It's motivation. And motivation to me is three things. Three things each day I try to do to get myself ready to roll. Some people will say to me, how do you motivate 18-year-old kids? How do you motivate yourself? I don't in 21 years motivate anybody except each day one person. I get up, James Thomas Anthony Valvano, and that's a full-time job keeping me up at the level I want. I hope that if I'm there, my assistants, my players, everyone will say, but I, that's a full-time job for me. I'm not a finger pointer. Say, hey, I'm working my, how about you? How come you, no, I work each day to get myself there. How motivation, number one, enthusiasm. Ralph Waldo Emerson, speaking to graduating class at Harvard, said nothing great has ever been accomplished without enthusiasm. How enthusiastic are you every day, every day in your profession? And I've got, I interview people for jobs, and I'm very bad. I'm one of the worst coaches to come and say, what are the, what's the benefits uh, here? I don't like that. I've never hired someone who's asked me. What the, one fella last year said to me, uh, do you have a dental plan? I said, yeah. If we don't win, the alumni kick our teeth in, you know? <laughs> I said, that's our dental plan. What is this? You know? That's me. I don't, like, I don't like when people ask me how many weeks off we get before they start to work. That's just me. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I am. And I'm, I know I'm probably not going to change in that regard. I like it. I love what I do. I'm very fortunate. Right? Enthusiasm. Give yourself an enthusiasm check. One of the things which is disappointing to me at times is when I travel around and speak and someone will say, that was a good talk. I wish my son my daughter heard. I said, what about you? What about you? He said, hey, I've been doing this job for 30 years. I don't need, oh. Someone else said, I've been doing this 23 years. Oh, I never understood that. See, I'm a dumb dago. I didn't realize that after a certain number of years in your profession, you put it on automatic pilot and you automatically win. You automatically sell. Why? Because by the very, the, the force of your presence, Right, so I said, wow, that's not a great thing to know. Next year when I coach, I go up to the other coach and say, how long have you been coaching? I say, eight years. Ha, <laughs> he's done. I'll kill him. I've been coaching 21. You got no shot. <laughs> Don't work that way. You must maintain each year the same enthusiasm. My second part of motivation is dream. Do you still dream? I still dream. I dream all the time. I dream. I, I watch that film a lot. I also, for my players, we have one practice every year where they come up on a court, there's no balls, there's no drills. All we do is practice cutting the net down. It's true, we'll have a scissor, I have a gold scissor. They, we carry each other up, we cut the net, they hook me up, I cut the last one, we do that, we film it, we go up in the, lock, in the locker room, we watch it. Then we watch us in 83 doing it, we see the reality, we see the dream. The dream can become the reality. How? By being enthusiastic, by feeling that you can't accomplish that. Extraordinary events from ordinary people and also by the work ethic that I don't have to tell you about. You know it. It just took me a long time to understand the relationship between work and success was not direct. If you work hard, you'll be successful. The relationship was if you don't work hard, you can't be successful. 
That's a big difference. It took me a while to understand that. That you work hard because that's the nature, that's part of being successful. But if you don't work hard, you have no shot. So there is my philosophy of getting the job done. A pinch of laughter each day. I think you should laugh every day. I want to be enthusiastic, keep my dream alive and work, even though I'm going to fail. And the last thing is what the rabbi was talking about. And when I was in, in the, uh, the room listening, I almost cried. He talked about his father. I want to talk about my father, and then I'll go out of here. Rocco Valvano. There's no, I have no problems telling you, and maybe it's my family. He talked about family. It means so much. I have no problem. I can look at anybody and tell you, I love my mother. I love my father. I had no problem saying it to them. I had no problem saying it. Never had a problem. I understand. I understand the statement that sometimes the people you think you know the least, if that wasn't the case with me. My father was the single most important influential person in my life. He never made a lot of money, and I think he's the richest man I ever knew. He never had a position of real importance, and yet he influenced more people than anyone else that I know. My father, Rocco Valvano. Let me tell you, so I know I'm running late. Let me tell you, you have to share. So when I, made, when I got uh, this job, my first job, I said to my pop, I said, boy, he's great dad. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, we're going to win a national championship. And he said, I'll be there. I said, it's hard to do that. He said, no, I'll be there. Right now, it took me eight years of work before I even made the tournament that was my dream to win, eight years. First year I made it, I'm coaching at Iona. I call up home, my dad, mom in New York, I said, we made it, we got a bid. So we celebrated the way Italians celebrate, we eat. You know, it was on a Sunday, we eat. All right, we start at two o'clock, you finish midnight. Half time about six o'clock, you know. My father calls me upstairs in his bedroom, which has never been in my father's bedroom, you know. And he calls you up and he says, there's a suitcase. Now remember I told you where my family's from, my father's never left New York. My father thinks everything north of the George Washington Bridge is Canada. Right? You understand that? Do you know what I'm saying? Right? My father, we live in the neighborhood with the Familaros, the Pizzamentis, the Kifas, the Coppolas. I brought her, my wife is the first fair-skinned person that my, I ever met. It's the truth. Brought her home, my father said, we're not sure what it is, but let's keep it. You know, he said, you know? So, you see what I'm talking about? This man, this old, this old guy, oh, he's got the suitcase, what's that for? He said, I'm gonna be there when you win the national champ. My bags are packed. I said, Pop, it's hard. Well, you'll do it. We lost in the first round. The next year, same thing. We lost the second round. He said, you're Gaina. I moved to North Carolina. We made the tournament. I called him. It became a phrase, a catchphrase. My father said, my bags are packed for you. My suitcase is packed for you. And we, we lost, and we kept losing. Well, the year we won, 1983, I got a great picture of my father and I on center court in Albuquerque, New Mexico, hugging. And my brother gave it to me, and it said, like, father, like son. It's the most important gift that I have from my brother, that picture, I know I'm not half the man my father is, but just that he knew what a compliment that would be to me. The father, that night we celebrated. I, my dad said, what are you gonna do now? I said, we're gonna do it again. He said, no, I'll be there. I said, I know you are. Right, the next year we made the tournament, called my bags of pack, we lost. Next year we made it, we lost. But we lost in regional finals. And after the game I called up, we lost to St. John's in Denver, Colorado. I called my pop, he said, what a great game I saw it. Oh, you were one, next year you'll make it. Then I flew home that night. He, he was one of those people who after I spoke to him, I always felt better than before. One of those, maybe you know somebody like that. After you talk to them, you feel better than you did before you went in, right? Maybe you know somebody. Well, now, I get home that night, it's two years ago, and this is what made me think about it. I got home, my house in North Carolina, a lot of people there, and I came, what's the matter? They called me in two years ago, April. My father had a heart attack and he died. And I lost my best friend in the whole world. This is not a sad story, it's a happy story. But I was knocked for a loop. Those of you who've lost a loved one, you know what that's like. This is my first time in my life. I didn't know how to handle it. And I, and I was missing. I couldn't understand what it was I was missing. A lot of people lose, you know, the people they love and maybe handle a little bit better. What was it? I didn't see him all the time. And I was traveling a lot, right? And then it hit me. What it was he gave me. I call it that. The gift my father gave me. And I think it's the strongest and most powerful gift I've ever received. And it's a gift I find we don't like to give to each other both in our business and our personal life. I spent two years trying to give this gift to other people. The gift my father gave me every day of my life was he believed in me. My father believed in me. He believed in me when I failed. He believed in me when I wasn't as fine a son, friend, husband, father as I could be, and that's, I've done all that. But he's the one person who, when I didn't measure up to my standard or someone else's standard, he'd look me in the eye and he'd say, you're going to make it. I know you are. My bags are packed. You're going to make it. 
And I, I, it's the greatest thing. And I said to myself, how many people do I give that to? My own players, and how often when they make a mistake, am I critical? But never, ever look them in the eye and say, son, you'll make it, I know you will. I know you can. I believe in it. Right? How many people who I work with do that? How many people who I work for do that? Oh, it's an incredible gift, and I've worked two years now to add it to my personal philosophy. I like to remember where I started. I know where I am, and I know where I'm going, and I know I'm going to get there. I'm going to be excited and enthusiastic every day that God gives me on this earth. I am going to dream my dreams. I'm going to work, not harder than anybody else, as hard as everyone, and accept the failures, right? And I'm going to laugh a little bit and believe in the people I work with, the people who work for me and the people I work for. And there's nothing going to stop me from cutting down the nets in my second national championship. And when I do, and when I do, I'm going to sprint out on the court. You'll know why that I'm sprinting out. You'll know that. And I'm going to look up and I'm going to say, Pop, this one's for you. And I know he's up there elbowing someone. I know it's not a referee. It's going to be somebody else, right? He's elbowing someone and saying, that's my son. I knew he was going to do it. My bags were always packed. I ask you to have your bags packed to share in the successes of others. To not only have your bags packed to share, but be able to believe in the people you work with. If you can fill each day, I think with that kind of belief and enthusiasm and a dream and a work ethic, a little left, I can't imagine us all not having a chance of cutting the nets down 52 years in a row, like my friend here. I said that at the beginning. This is a special audience. It's a special group. It's been very motivating and invigorating for me to be here. I, I know that you folks can accomplish anything you want. I know that because my father told me so. God bless you, and I hope you have the kind of year that you want to have. Thank you so much.